Hello everyone and welcome to my presentation about cryptocurrencies and remittances, a happy marriage. My name is Marcus Björklund and I'm the head of financial crime pre uh, prevention at Zappello, <clears throat> which is a Swedish broker for cryptocurrencies. Before working in the cryptocurrencies industry, I have been working in the money remittance industry for a company where I was able to learn and see like the importance of cross-border payments. Therefore, this presentation will be about blockchain technology, cryptocurrencies and remittances. So this is the agenda of today's presentation. Uh, first, I will do a quick introduction to Safalo and who we are, and then moving on with explaining like the background of remittances and the impact the industry has on a global level, then a quick overview of today's landscape. Then I will present the challenges that the remittance industry has today. Um, after that, I will explain quickly about the blockchain technology and what cryptocurrencies are. Then moving on to explain what inherent risks that the technology and cryptocurrencies have and how companies are able to mitigate these risks. And last, I will try to explain my view and thoughts on how I believe that the remittance industry will look like in the future and how blockchain technology can be used for cross-border payments. But first, like I said, a quick introduction to Safalo. So, Safalo was founded in 2013 and is a Swedish cryptocurrency brokerage for a Swedish-based customer. The name Safalo comes from safe and fellow and it represents our motto that you can invest in cryptocurrencies in a safe and secure way. Safalo is offering a solution for institutions, retail and business customers to, to buy, sell, deposit, withdraw and store crypto assets in our own wallet which was launched in 2001. Uh, 2021 I mean sorry so all of our customers are able to identify themselves with like digital ID verification tool from from Sweden we are offering several uh, payment options for our customers to buy the crypto assets such as instant mobile payments uh, a vendor payment system and SIPA payments we are also enabling our customers to interact with us in KYC processes through like an open banking provider to provide a service that is as digital and smooth as possible uh, now moving on to the background of remittances. Uh, remittances are typical transfers from one person to another person or like a household. Typically it is by a foreign worker, a member of the diaspora community or a citizen with like familial ties abroad, which is sending money back home to their home country or homeland. But first, just some insightful thoughts about blockchain and cryptocurrencies that represent uh, what this presentation will be about. As the first quote states, this presentation will show you how blockchain technology will be able to speed up and reduce the cost in the remittance industry. The second quote represents that since the benefits of using cryptocurrencies, it is believed that this will be able to speed up the development of the digital infrastructure in parts of the world where it might not be as developed as necessary for it to be used today. And and the last quote represents that cryptocurrencies are not that complicated uh, to use as many think and that by using it, the receivers of the remittances will get more in their pockets since it's cheaper. It is a cheaper way and also more secure uh, than the way today. Some interesting facts about uh, the money remittances. So across the developed world, uh, we all take for granted to have a bank account where we can safely store our money and have it at at hand at any time through a debit or a credit card or by going to an ATM and withdraw money. However, in the world today, over 1.7 billion adults don't have access to a bank account. This represents around 22% of the total global pop uh, of the population. So aside from the obvious advantages to be able to access your money at any time, a bank account also connects people to the former financial systems and enables people to make day-to-day -day living less complicated but also enables the individuals to build up their financial assets. And I think you can all agree to that by not having access to your money wherever you are, it would make your life much more difficult. And around 800 million people in the world, which is around one in nine people globally are recipients of these remittances that are sent by their family uh, who have migrated to other countries uh, to work. These remittances represent around 60% of a family's household income and 75% of these funds are being used to cover essential needs in their lives such as food, 
medical expenses, uh, school fees or other necessary housing expenses. So as you can see, these remittances are a lifeline for a lot of people uh, globally and they would not be able to survive without receiving these, these funds. So, and for example, in Tonga, an island in the Pacific Ocean, the remittances represent almost 40% of the GDP. Or in Somalia, in Africa, it represents almost 35% of the GDP. And in Africa, the average representation of remittances of the GDP is almost 5%. And in Latin America, it is as high as 7% with El Salvador on top with 24% of their GDP. So as you can hear on these numbers, households in these countries are dependent on the diaspora community to send money back home. The remittances can also help to contribute to like several of the goals set by or set in the 2030 or to, to, um, to 2030, like the Sustainable Development Agenda, which are different kinds of goals set by the UN for facing problems. So some of the goals that remittances can contribute to solve are the no poverty, uh, the zero hunger, uh, good health and well-being, uh, quality education, clean water and sanitation, decent work and economic growth, and reduced inequality. So to reach these goals, governments, regulators, and also the private sector would play an important role to leverage the effects of the remittances. Uh, statistics also shows that half of these remittances actually goes to rural areas, where 75% of the world's poor and food insecure population live. And in the next five years, it is expected that the remittances will reach $1 trillion there. Uh, a very interesting fact is that remittances are actually three times the amount of official development assistance and foreign direct investment. This really represents the power and the importance of this private source of capital that is being sent back home, I think. Another important factor to take into account here is that a remittance of $100 actually goes directly to the receiver's pocket without any middleman. Whereas for the official development assistance and for indirect investments, as you can understand, there are a lot of administration costs, for example. Uh, numbers are showing that once a country or the world is facing a crisis, the remittance industry is an even bigger lifeline for people. During the COVID-19 pandemic, uh, certain countries that were affected uh, more by the pandemic, there was an increase of the funds being sent back home. And the last example here in Europe is that the, with the war in Ukraine, this is actually expected to increase about 20%. So to, uh, moving on to today's uh, market landscape. Uh, the three highest sending countries in the world are the US, the United Arab Emirates and Saudi Arabia. Whereas the highest receiving countries are India, China and Mexico. Uh, and as you can see, these six countries kind of proves themselves in a way, I would say, like that the people, like many people that live in United Arab Emirates, Saudi Arabia, are immigrants from India and China, and the same with many Mexicans are living in the US. So, and their money remittance industry is a very old business model and that has been around for a long time. And due to the fact that ever since its beginning, it has been uh, very complex to have systems in place, they can offer this service to the diaspora community. One significant factor that matters very much for them is trust, which is very logic since a person sending money back home to their family must be sure that the money actually arrives to, the right, to its right receiver. So because of this, many companies have been around for a very long time since the users of these services trust those companies because they have been used before. So this has led to that the people who are actually using the service services often knows the landscape very well and which companies that they can trust with sending money back home. So if, and we, if we take a look on this graph, so this World Globe is uh, trying to explain in a simplified way how the remittance industry works. Uh, as you can see on the map, we have a few examples of uh, well-known money remittance companies such as Western Union, World Remit and Small World. And and that they are, they, they are very important for their money remittance industry every day. And in a simplified way, you can say that these companies are connecting different banks with each other. And in order to do so, these companies must have many agreements in place with 
normally hundreds of different banks around the world to be able to provide your service uh, to their customers. And one crucial system that enables this to work is the SWIFT system, which probably most of you already know what it is, but the SWIFT system acts as a kind of carrier of the transfer between the banks, containing important messages and information, so for the banks to be able to like talk to each other. However, as you can understand, when involving that many parties in so many different parts of the world, there are still like many issues in the back end, which ends up with that, uh, that there are still like global interoperability issues. So as I explained earlier regarding the background uh, of, the, of the remittances, I hope that those points have enabled you all to understand like the importance of this industry. Nevertheless, the industry is facing challenges like every day because of their global operations. Uh, and in this presentation, I will go through like four of the main challenges that these uh, companies and the diaspora uh, community face every day. And I will start with like the high cost challenge. So we saw that the industry really requires a lot of different partnerships between banks and the companies to be enabled to move the money from like one country to another. And this has led to higher costs because as any other market, the more intermediaries you have, the higher cost you will also have. So this graph here shows you the average price of sending $200. We can see that it is going in the right direction, but the global average is still as high as about 6%, which was about 9% 10 years ago. Uh, by this graph, we can also draw the conclusion that the major reason for the global average to decrease are companies acting in the digital space, whereas the decrease of the fees has been from like 10 to 12 percent down to actually 4 to 5 percent. Uh, and one important take from these numbers are that the fees depends very much also on where the money is being sent. So as you can see, uh, the fees between uh, different so-called corridors are very big. So in South Asia, the fee is around 4.3, whereas in the Sub-Saharan, you pay almost 8%. Uh, and another important point from this slide is that the banks remains as an industry with the highest fees for remittances. And this is very much related, I believe, to, to the quote that where the digital infrastructure is low, you will also see like higher fees. As I just mentioned, the, uh, like the graph on top here confirms it uh, that it is that it very much depends on where you are sending your money. Like these different colors represent an interval of the fees. So, for example, the dark blue means like fees less than less than five percent, light blue five to ten percent, and so on. Uh, and over the past decade, we can see a positive trend since. 40% of the global corridors have fees under 5%, which in 2009 were only at 17%. And again, by looking at the second graph here, uh, we can see that it is the digital space that is like pushing down the fees. But even, but however, you, you can also see that the traditional MTO index is also making uh, like a progress. The second challenge that the industry has today is the speed. So first for everyone to understand the whole process of our remittance, I will quickly go through it in a very simplified way. But basically like the sender goes to like an MTO operator and they or the person provides information about the sender and also like the beneficiary, if it's going to be like a bank deposit or like a cash out. The money transfer operator then takes this information and makes a transfer with their own banks. And through the Swift stiffs, through the SWIFT systems and like clearing the payment, it is sent uh, to the o o overseas bank, then then can pay out this money to the receiver in the country. So one of the issues, uh, which is one of the major ones globally, is the time it takes for different parties to do settlements. So the world of traditional foreign exchange has remained quite silent for years and you can only make also uh, make payments during regular banking hours and while messages are sent via SWIFT, payment aren't actually settled until a, a few days uh, later and sometimes it, it can even take five days. So due to these delays and for money remittance companies to be able to provide a good service to the customers with a quicker payout to the receiver, it has created like a workflow where money remittance companies must pre-fund banks globally. So how this works is that the money remittance companies must send funds 
to banks in order to pre-fund them with liquidity so that the receiver's bank can actually pay out the amount much faster than five days. Uh, as you can understand, this is a very complex process where money remittance companies must estimate and calculate how much funds that they think their senders will send globally to hundreds of different countries. And if the estimates are bad or, or, or wrong, this will affect the payout uh, time for the receiver which means that if the money that are being sent as the pre-funding amount is too little the receiver will not be able to cash it out or cash out the money which of course is a big issue in terms of like uh, the customer experience and the promises that the money remittance company has given to the sender and the receiver and on top of that since banks are not open 24 7 this can cause big delays with different bank holidays around the world where one bank in one country can be closed due to a specific bank holiday, meaning that the receiver might need to be, might need to wait even longer for cashing out the money. And the last the contractual differences is referring to the issue that due to the number of like partnership that is necessary for this industry to work, they are highly dependent on having agreements with hundreds of different banks and partners globally. This is often one of the competitive advantages between the, uh, between the companies where the companies with the most and the best agreements globally can offer the, like, the best solution for the customers. Another challenge of today's market is the transparency. So uh, due to the fact that many intermediaries are involved in one single transfer, it is not always clear for the customer what they are actually paying for since every intermediary wants to make a profit. Uh, the fee is shown to the sender at the time of the transfer is being done, of course, so, so that they know what they will pay. However, the fees are normally not specified for the customer to know exactly what the fees are for each transaction uh, or for each interaction. I mean, with an intermediary, uh, which from my side is a lack of transparency for the customer. So, and because of the multiple intermediaries, the customer doesn't always uh, know the status of the payment and where it is stuck or delayed since they are not able to see exactly how the money flows. The customer is often only provided with the information that the money remitting companies is deciding to share with them, and meaning that information can actually be hidden for the sender. So ideally, as a customer, uh, you, you, you should be able to follow each step of his or her transfer in order to have like full transparency to towards the customer uh, and the last issue with transparency is like the data on the money remittance flow is not like always 100% accurate and um, with this I mean that since the information lies at the hands of the money remittance companies and their banks it is very hard to have like 100% insight of the outflow and the inflow of the transfer that is happening under, under or overestimating this flow can be an issue for national authorities to have like full controls of how the market actually looks like and this can in then affect maybe the goals of the SDA that I talked about uh, earlier. As I pointed out many times already, for this industry to work it is necessary to have like multiple systems uh, and to use multiple systems um, uh, you also have like multi or you have multiple different parties which increases the risk for relying on third parties right so when a company is reliant on multiple partnerships the risk increases of something not working out as planned uh, any company or any system can be attacked uh, have internal problems which in the end affect the end users of the service that they are using and with the issue of transparency the customer are not really aware of what is happening in the background if something goes wrong. Uh, the nature of the industry that many parties are involved is also a privacy concern for the for the customers since uh, since the multiple systems and the parties are in, involved it means that the customer data is shared among many parties and this increases the risk of the customer data to be exposed to an un unauthorized party. But since there is no better option available at the moment, this is a risk that the customer must be willing to take in order to have or, or in order to be able to send money back home. So this is the end of the background of the money remittance industry and the challenges that the industry is facing today. We will now move on uh, what blockchain technology and the cryptocurrency is. Uh, I will not deep dive in the technicalities, but I will try to give like a brief uh, like overview of these two things. 
So blockchain is normally like a transparent and decentralized database which keeps track of every single peer-to-peer -peer transaction in real time. It is transparent in the sense that anyone can view a public blockchain and it's decentralized in the sense that all users possesses identical copies of the blockchain and that not one person or authority has governing power over the blockchain or its users. So changes within the blockchain must be agreed on by reaching a, like, a, like a majority of consensus by all its users. So the name block comes from that every transaction is recorded and stored as a block of information. Each block is then def defined by a block number and stores the transaction data such as the transaction amount and a record of like which wallets that took part in the transaction. Each block is cryptographically verified to authenticate and validate the transaction uh, or the transactions occurring within that block. This results in like in immutable and unedible database that is always available. So the point of a blockchain is that it removes the needs for like a central point of data reliability and it also removes the use of like unnecessary intermediaries or like middlemen and allows for like a trustless behavior and transactions. Uh, there are many more aspects that can be discussed and explained. However, for this presentation, I believe like this overview gives you enough explanation to follow what is coming uh, next. Uh, for something to be called a cryptocurrency, you can basically say that it needs to fulfill two to three uh, different uh, criteria. First, there has to be any form of currency that exists digitally or like virtually. Then it has to use like the cryptographic to secure the transactions, which is like the blockchain. And last, it is also normally organized and run by a decentralized peer-to-peer -peer network. However, it also exists cryptocurrencies that are fully centralized, meaning that the last criteria is not always fulfilled. As any technology, blockchain and cryptocurrencies have inherent risk factors that needs to be taken into account when using them. So this presentation will not be able to go through uh, all the risk factors, but I've chosen the ones that I believe are the main ones and that relates to this presentation's topic. So the most important inherent risk factors associated with like cryptocurrencies. So first we have volatility. As many of you probably know, cryptocurrencies tend to be very volatile asset. So during the years we have seen many ups and downs, for example, for Bitcoin and there are also a lot of cryptocurrencies that have been pure scams or pumps and dumps, for example. So this is, of course, something very negative for, for an asset if you want it to be used as a transfer of value. As a sender in the, rem in the remittance industry, you want to be sure that the amount that you're sending is actually, the, is actually the amount that the receiver will be able to cash out. It is decentralized, so, so the decentralization. Uh, so as I explained though, so the most cryptocurrencies are decentralized or decentralized peer-to-peer -peer network, which means that there is no like central authority that controls and ensures that transactions on the blockchain comply with like laws and regulations, which is an important factor for the remittance industry to bring safety uh, to the customer. And the cyber attacks, like because cryptocurrencies is not like strictly controlled there are difficulties with like recovering the funds if the private keys are like stolen on like a blockchain but uh, I will also say that cyber threats to cryptocurrencies are similar uh, to the risk of like any types of business so and in today's world like nothing is safe from like the cyber criminals and very often it is not the actual blockchain that has get hacked but a company and a platform like providing access to these blockchains, meaning that the cyber threats are very much related to the number of like preventative measures that the company who provides the service has in place against uh, like cyber threats. Irreversible transactions. So transactions on the blockchain are like irreversible, which is a potential th uh, threat because fraud can cannot be re reversed once they are completed and funds are sent to like when they are sent to like another cryptocurrency or wallet. And the irreversibility of transactions may encourage criminals to attack users of like a blockchain. So 
And the anonymous or pseudo-anonymous transactions. So the anonymous and pseudo-anonymous transactions on the blockchain can like hide the origin and the purpose of the transaction uh, of uh, like and money. So no name is attached to like a cryptocurrency wallet address and therefore these addresses by themselves cannot be associated with like any real person or entity. So each virtual ad uh, address in the blockchain network is just represented by a randomly generated signature numbers. A customer with low level of knowledge about cryptocurrencies are in general like easier to target for social engineering. Uh, they're often money mules recruited by like professional money launderers or scam victims who are like deceived into transferring illicit proceeds without knowledge of their origin. Uh, and no central server or institution that regulates the blockchain, I, as I said before, like since there's no central authority that controls and ensures the transactions on the blockchain comply with laws and regulations and that they are not used for money laundering and terrorist financing purposes. So what can a company within like this industry do then to mitigate these risks? So <clears throat> in the cryptocurrency world, there are uh, something called like stable coin. So stable coins are cryptocurrencies that attempt to peg their market value to like an external reference. So for example, like the US dollar. Today, there are several uh, stable coins <clears throat> available on the market, such as the USDT or USDC. Both these stable coins are paid to the US dollar and the market value of one coin is like one to one towards the US dollar. Again, I will not go through like the technicalities uh, here, but there are like different kinds of stable coins out there. For example, we have stable coins who are fiat collateralized, meaning that as the name suggests, backed by a sovereign currency such as the US dollar. It means that to issue a certain number of tokens of a given currency, the issuer must offer dollar reserves worth the same amount as collateral. So this type of stablecoin is considered like an off-chain asset. So and crypto collateralized stablecoin, like instead of being collateralized by a fiat currency, these types of stablecoins are backed by like a cryptocurrencies and uh, is operate without a central issuer, uh, making them like decentralized and then on-chain. Non-collateralized stable coin is like basically the tokens rely on like an algorithm which is able to change the supply volume to maintain the token's price when uh, to which is paid to like as an external reference. So non-collateralized stable coin rely on smart contracts to like sell tokens if the price falls below the peg or to supply tokens to the market if the value increases. And in this ways the token remains stable and holds its, its peg. So, uh, so what the stable coins can do is actually offer the speed and the privacy of cryptocurrencies along with the stability of government issued uh, fiat currency. Uh, to mitigate this free risk, uh, so decentralization, cyber attacks and anonymous transactions that relates to uh, uh, AML and CTF risk. Uh, I believe that we will see companies who are supporting and using uh, a specific uh, cryptocurrencies. Uh, this would bring like trust towards the customer, which I said before uh, is one of the most important thing for the diaspora uh, community. Uh, if the customer knows that there's a company is using and supporting a specific cryptocurrency, they would have more trust toward that uh, cryptocurrency and be comfortable with using it, I believe. A company uh, bringing trust would also make the customer feel more safe when it comes to cyber attacks. As I said, this is something that they are already exposed to in the traditional in in industry and since anyone can be hacked. So, but if a company is there and I believe that the customer once again will feel a little bit more safe to use actually cryptocurrencies uh, because of these threats. And a company who is in the remittance industry are also subject to like AML and CTF regulations. This means that this company would need to implement different kinds of preventative measures towards this risk and to have like KYC measures in place. Um, even if preventive measures sometimes can be seen like as annoying for the customers, it also brings a lot of security to the customer since they will know that the companies are compliant with the law and making their transfer secure. Uh, these measures that would 
need to be implemented would also mitigate the risk of transactions on the blockchain to be like anonymous even though a specific transfer would still be anonymous on the blockchain when checking like the public ledger it would though be possible for like authorities and companies to be able to identify who issued a transaction for that and this is actually what is already happening uh, in today's world another important point here is that there is something called the travel rule that is uh, about to be implemented which is in a simplified way can be explained as that all transactions on like a blockchain performed by a company would need to carry some specific information like the swift system uh, the travel rule will completely change how things are working in this space but unfortunately i think this is uh, that we will need a whole other uh, presentation to explain in detail so today uh, we are used to be operating in a system of like soft promises this means that your bank can reverse your transaction if you want or, you, or if you don't want because you asked for it or maybe because of the government asked for it. So a system of soft promises has its own problems as you can see. So, and the blockchain systems are hard promises, okay? Um, and there's an important subtle distinction that needs to be understood here. So Bitcoin, for example, does not guarantee that a payment will happen irreversibly. What Bitcoin guarantees is that the contract within the transaction will be executed irreversibly. And if that contract says, for example, that without a second thought or something, please give the money to like address X and don't look back, then that is the contract that is going to be executed irreversibly. But the thing is that this is not the only contract that you can put in there. Like you could put, for example, a contract that says that this payment can only be made after X amount of days with a 30 day refund payment controlled by like a third party escrow signature that can resolve a dispute. And then that contract will be executed irreversibly. And your choices that you have put in there will be guaranteed. So. You can actually decide all of the softness that you want so you could do like 30 day refund uh, and you can even introduce like the consumer refunds uh, but it's also very important to point out that the fundamental difference here is that the owner of the money is the only one who can reintroduce those constraints so this means that you will actually be able to decide and tailor all the conditions and the controls you want so this is not actually like an irreversible payment but it's an irreversible guarantee that the conditions that you have expressed as a customer within your transaction script will get executed exactly the way you want so I understand that yes of course this sounds very complex to do and that you need to be able to like write scripts but this is really just like an engineering problem and um, that is going to be solved and it's already solved in a way with like the smart contracts where you can put in your conditions but again smart contracts and nfts is also like another uh, topic for another time so so the difference here between these two systems are that there's one system that delivers hard promises which can be softened and a system that delivers soft promises which can't get any harder so you can imagine or so you can say in like one way that this risk is like based on a misunderstanding of the underlying uh, mechanism of blockchain. So with this implementation and the improvements of the blockchain, this will also help people with low knowledge since there will be like underlying mechanisms that are going to protect the customers in the future. Uh, since the landscape of laws and regulations are low uh, for the cryptocurrencies, this can be a risk for the customers, as I already mentioned. Uh, but we can see and we know that laws are coming uh, in the near future. Like the travel rule implementation is one thing and another is Mika. Uh, that is an EU, EU law that will clarify how like cryptocurrencies companies and exchanges are supposed to act on the market. Like these laws will give like customers more security to to use uh, cryptocurrencies in the future, I believe. So after all this that I've gone through, like do I think that cryptocurrencies and remittances will be like a happy marriage? So as I see it uh, and how I believe that the future of the remittance industry will look like, 
I think that we can expect that more stable coins will be issued to guarantee the value of a transfer. I don't think customers are willing to risk the volatility here since the money is so important for, this, for the receivers. I also believe that these stable coins will either be issued by a company making the cryptocurrency like a little bit more centralized maybe, or that the company is having like a very central role in supporting the stable coin to ensure like that, that the stable coin stays pegged to its external value. Uh, but the biggest change that I think we will see is actually what, I, what kind of transactions we are sending. As I just explained with the irreversible uh, transactions, this is an engineering problem that I believe that we will need to solve before customers are like 100% comfortable to use the cryptocurrencies. But like I have no doubt that that will actually come with smart solutions and smart contracts, for example, uh, uh, here. And, and in this way that like the companies can guarantee safety in the transactions, both for the sender and the receiver. And yeah, so I mentioned like the smart contracts. And I believe that this is uh, that that we will see like this is the way that we will uh, see the future uh, remittances to be sent. And together with like new regulations coming up, which will also ensure the customers that companies are following applicable laws. This will also add like a layer of security to the company uh, to the customers. So in my opinion, I really believe that the remittance industry and the cryptocurrencies will be a happy marriage. So that was it for me. Uh, thank you very much for listening to this presentation. I, I really hope that I could bring some insightful thoughts on the remittance industry and how blockchain and cryptocurrencies uh, can be used in the future. Uh, thank you very much. And I hope you enjoyed it.